Welcome to Ablaze Ministries International Podcast. We are the youth and young adults of Hope Church Brisbane. For more information about our ministries, weekly gatherings and activities, please visit our website at www.ablaze.org.au. And right now, get ready for an inspiring message and start living out your God-given potential today. Thanks, Sarah. Amen. Hey, guys, you know, our, this, our mental um, motto that we believe in is discipling generation who change nations, right? And I think it's really good to see, like, even Sarah was spending time here. And through her life today, you know, you can see that she actually has the influence, you know, in, in um, her home church back in Malaysia. And, you know, I really believe that what we're doing here is so, so important. Amen. Amen. So I hope you guys are encouraged by that, hey. So I think it's, it's amazing to see what God has been doing in and through our lives. So um, tonight, um, we're starting a new series, as I said before, and I'm so excited because I really want to do something that really reinforces what God has done um, from camp. Because last week, I was so blown away by what the Lord actually did in every one of us, especially those who came up here and share the testimony. So I really want us to really stay, um, you know, even more um, anticipating of what God is going to be doing. Amen. So I really hope you guys, hey guys, come on, come on. I know it's Friday night, we can be a little bit tired, but don't, don't let our physical tiredness stop us from receiving from the Lord. Amen. So I want you guys to stay engaged. I want you guys to stay engaged. Don't check your Facebook. Don't do anything online or whatnot. Just write it down. should bring along your Bible and your notebook because this is the time that we're really going to come and really study the Word of God together. Amen? Amen. So um, I actually got a short clip to, to, to start off this series. So if you guys want to look at the screen. All right. It's just a really short clip that I show you guys. But many of us here, we have read um, the story of Nehemiah. Anyone here, you guys have read the story of Nehemiah? Yeah? Okay. Maybe some of you guys, this is the first time that you're actually hearing this. But I really believe that, you know, there's so much um, that, that, that we can learn from this book as well. So if you like, I want you guys to turn to the book of Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament. All right. Let's do that, everybody. Yeah, like I said before, bring along the Word of God um, and take some good notes. Amen. It will be good for your soul. <laughs> okay? So, all right. Let's turn to um, chapter 1, and I'm just going to be reading that today quickly. 1 and um, a bit of chapter 2 as well. Okay, the words of Nehemiah, son of uh, Hakaliah, the month of Kislev, in the 20th a year while I was in citadel of Susa, um, Hanani, uh, one of my brothers um, came from Judah and some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. So underline that the great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And it, its gates have been burned with fire. Verse 4, when I heard these things, when Nehemiah heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keep his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive you and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before um, your day and night for your servant. The people of Israel, I confess the sin we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and law you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are faithful, if, sorry, if unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. If you return to me and obey my commands, and if um, then even if your exiled people are at the um, furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as the ruling for my name. In verse 10, 
They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servants success today by granting them favor in the presence of this man. I was cup barrier to the king. Wow, this is awesome prayer, prayer right? It's just a long prayer, but it's good. In chapter 2 now, guys, let's turn to chapter 2 quickly. Verse 1 to 5, it says, In the month of Nisan, so actually a while after that, so the chapter 1 is the month of Kislev, and now it's the month of Nisan. In the 20th year of King um, Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, what does your face, what, so why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors were um, are buried um, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I pray to, to God of heaven, and I answer the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Okay, are you guys following the story? Yeah, you guys following the story. Now, I know there's a lot to take in tonight, but I really want to capture a few things for all of us here to understand. And I said before that this sermon series is meant to really reinforce what God has already started in our hearts. So four weeks, guys, starting today and um, up until the, the, the week before the church conference is coming, out, um, coming up um, called um, Step Out. I think that would be another great, great, great time of um, really um, getting, you know, getting challenged and getting excited again about what God's going to be doing. So, um, so this series really talking about the possibility. Can you say with me, possibility? And 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 the fact it is that that with God all things are possible. Can you say with me, with God, all things are possible. Now, now, say it again. One more time with the conviction. You don't just say it, but you say it with conviction, okay? With God, all things are possible. Oh, let the faith come out, man. You know, I really believe that this series is about the possibility and the things that we can believe God for. Now, listen to me carefully. In God's business, everyone can be used for His glory. But when it comes to the world, things can be a little bit different because the world looks for people who are very talented, people who got everything together, people who feel that they have the capacities and abilities to achieve things. But in God's eyes, when people are called to God's service, it's a little bit different because God first looks at our hearts. God sees our hearts, and the word that I should share again and again is our availability and our willingness. You know what? That was a, that's sort of people that God can use. You know, I have worked with so many people, talented people, people who got so much, you know, in them, people who got resources. But I can tell you, after 20-something years of ministry, if I can choose, I'd rather work with people who got the heart, but maybe with little gift things that they have. Because those abilities and gifting can be trained. Over time, if you're faithful, you will grow. But if you have the bad attitude and you have pride, it's going to be really hard to work with. You know what? I really believe very much that tonight, God's going to really stir something in your heart. Because He specializes in using ordinary people. You know, when I started out, I, kn I knew very much nothing. It's not like a lot that I knew, but very much nothing. And, and I would like to really encourage you guys here because I really believe that this is your time. This is the season that you guys need to rise up. This is the season you can't just sit back and just wait for the leaders to do things. It's a season that you yourself step up and act and believe that God can work in and through you. Guys, if a blaze, if all of us here have sort of conviction like that, you know, we will see more and more people coming in. You guys, I want to really challenge you. You know, it's been a long time that we have this sort of number in our service. And 
I don't know about you. I, I don't just do church. I want to see people come to know the love of Jesus. I want to see people come to encounter God. But it takes every one of us here being a part of this endeavor that we can really see the kingdom of God come. You know, I want to challenge the leaders first and foremost. We don't just do church leaders. We don't just have this pastoral thing that we do week in, week out. But you are called for such a time as this that you are given the opportunity to disciple people for Jesus Christ. So it's not the elite group. It's not the people who look like, oh, they're really cool. They're really spiritual. But we are servants of God and we meant to help other people grow. That means you have to stretch yourself. You have to give up certain things in your life so that you can serve the Lord more. You know, I don't believe in, you know, we are being too much spiritual. There's no such thing in the Bible. Because everything we do, when God called us, we meant to be zealous for the Lord. A blaze, we have the name. And the name is about burning brightly for Jesus. But many times, you see, we get burnt out because we don't work on our relationship with Him. So we work, you know, from our own strength, and no wonder that we get burnt out. But if every day we are like that branch, you know, that we plucked into the vine, that we make sure that our lives in God is strong and healthy, let me tell you, you will change the world. Because you are driven by a different source. It's not your strength, but it's divine. And it's supernatural. And I can speak to all you guys who are not a part of the leadership team. You are the future of this church. You are the future of a blaze. We don't just exist for having church. I'm not interested in that. That's why I want to see that we really make the opportunity every time we come to the service. See so safe, guys. Bring someone along to the service. Really want to see everyone of us reach out to someone. And it's not about number, but it's about souls that are being touched and changed by God. And don't you ever apologize for getting excited for Jesus. You know, when I think about balance in life, it's actually it's about following God and allow God to lead and guide us, right? When you think about the life of Jesus, he did everything the Father called him to do. And that's how he balanced his life, to do the Father's will, to follow the will of the Father. So give it all for Jesus. You know, you have one life to live and live it all for Jesus, that you give you all for him. I can tell you, you never regret that decision. Okay, that's not in my note. I'm just so pumped to share that. And this is the story of the guy. He was just an ordinary person. He was just a cup bearer. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't one of the wisest people in that city. He was just a cup bearer. Nehemiah was a great leader because what we see here is the origin of everything that we're about to see throughout this book because he was used by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem within 52 days. And for your own background, these walls have been in ruin for many, many years, 100 years. And because of the disobedience in the hearts of God's people, they were in captivity, they were slaves. But now... God has not forgotten his people, and he is using Nehemiah to be the catalyst for change. And I wonder how many of us here tonight that we will say, God, I want to be the catalyst for change. That you use me. That when you look around this room, that you see me. That it's me, 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 me. That every hand is lifted up because God is searching. He's doing the business of using ordinary people to do amazing things, extraordinary for him. If you are willing so from this passage, quickly, you guys, I just want to give you guys this, um, you know. So what we see here is that Nehemiah, now he in, he in um, the palace and he, he works as a cup bearer. You guys know what does a cup bearer do? You know, kings and people in the royal family in the palace, like, you know, sometimes, you know, every, before they're about to actually eat food, there will be this guy who actually makes sure there's no poison in food. This guy will actually test food. They're actually food testers. So they just go and eat the food of the king, but not eat like eat a lot, but you just test the food. If someone poisoned, you know, the king, tried to actually kill the king, this guy would die first. So the thing here is that it, it seems like a really ordinary job, right? But listen to this. The trust that the king would have with this guy has got to be really huge. So it's not something that anyone can actually be in that position. 
But for some reason, God put this man in that position to be in the position of influence. He might not be well known as the smartest guy in that town, in that palace, but he was right there in that opportune moment that God is about to use him for his purpose. He was just available. And when we look at this passage, you know, I want to share with you guys briefly. You know, Sarah talked about three C's. Actually, I want to talk about three C's today as well. It's the qualities that God's looking for in ordinary world changes. Ordinary world changes, three qualities. And the first C that I want to share quickly with you guys today is this, being compassionate. Compassionate. Can you say with me, compassionate? God uses those who have the heart of compassion. Okay, let me actually make it really simple for you. These people, they do care for the things of God. They do care for other people. When you look at this passage, what we see here is that Nehemiah received the news from his friends, from his cousin, from the people, you know, that he knew. And he learned about the ruin of the walls. You guys, back in those days, the things that really dignified any place, any city is the, is the city. Oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's the it's a, Gate is the walls around them. The new movie is coming out, The Great Wall. Yeah? I mean, I haven't seen it. I just saw the trailer. It's everywhere. But, you know, that got me to think, yeah, you know what? Really, when you want to see the strength of the city, the dignity of the city, anything is about a city. They're talking about safety, you know, or whatnot. You look at how thick the walls are. You look at how big and how tall you know, it's like, whoa. Have you guys ever seen any, like, billionaire, no millionaire, but millionaire's houses? Like, you see the gate, you see, like, wow, you know, super cool, right? Super cool. And it's like, you know, it's the same thing that we see from here is that, but what we learn is that the walls, they weren't ruined. Of course, the people did not feel safe. So when he might have heard about that, the first thing, the Bible said, he wept. So God use those people who sit down and weep. <laughs> if today you, 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 like, you have a manly tear, someone said man, manly tear last week, you know. It's okay to have the manly, you call man tear or manly tear, I don't know, but yeah. So, but God is still using people who actually feel compassionate towards something. We heard this all the time, boys don't cry. I don't think that is true. You are allowed to cry because Jesus actually wept. <laughs> and, you know, God is using people who do care about his agendas. You know, it's, it's really easy to come into church and to point every of wrongs about that place. It's easy to go into your life group and point to different things that you're not happy with. Do you agree? It's so easy to go somewhere and you just start criticizing about how bad things are. But God is not in the business of trying to point out what's wrong with the place. But he is rising up the next generation who will believe what can be done in this place. Like I said this before, don't just criticize. Be the change that you want to see. Be the solution. You know, put your hand up. Volunteer yourself. Be a part of that um, solution. You know, what we see here is that Nehemiah got so compassionate towards the things of God and the people of God. I just like it because, you know, this guy, he actually was in the palace. He was really comfortable with where he was. He was really enjoying his life. I don't know about you. And actually, the place he was actually about hundred, uh, more than 100,000 miles away. But he felt for the people. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, when you watch documentary on television or whatnot, you see people go hungry, you know, starving children and people who got, like, human trafficked or what, whatever. Like, sometimes we feel 
you know, like compassion towards that. And then what we do, maybe we just, okay, you feel a little bit of that and you change the channel and you forget about it. You know, or maybe you actually save up money, you so send some monies and, and that's it. But this is not what Nehemiah felt. It cut right through his heart and his soul. The Bible say he wept. It's just like, I want to actually dramatize this a little bit. You know, it's like, he's just like, when he heard that, the Bible said he fell down and he wept. He didn't just cry. He was like, oh. I would imagine when you read the Bible, read it actively. Because the scripture said he actually wept and he prayed. And listen to this. I, I, I touch on the month, right? You know, sometimes we read the Bible, oh, month of um, Nisan or, you know, his level. What does it mean? Actually, it's, a, it's not just like for a short period of time that this guy, that Nehemiah was feeling, you know, compassionate towards the people and the things of God. It was a period of time that he was considering and that thing was on his mind. Are you guys still excited and passionate for the things of God? One of the things that this generation tends to forget is the things of God and God's agenda. Many of you in this place, you have grown up in church. Can I have a hand of people who've been in church for so long? Yep. You know, last week, Elaine shared the pic. This week, actually, you shared the picture, you know, of Eric, of Sam, of Tim, of Daniel. Were you in there, Paul? Paul, Deborah, you know, Lisa and I we was like, whoa, these guys are still rocking church. They're not only attending church, they're serving in the church. And that is cool. Everybody, that is awesome. And I hope that 10 years from now, when you actually share the same picture, because Facebook can remind you seven years ago this happened, or whatever year, how many years, and I hope that not just five, six, seven of you guys, but when we look at a Blaze Cam picture this year, that we still see everybody, not just attending church, but serving ch in church and serving God. And that is cool. Let me tell you again, that is so cool. We need to be concerned about God's agenda, guys. Don't just rock up to church and thinking that this is just another thing that we do on Friday night. This is the opportune time for you to be imparted with the Spirit of God so that you will rise up and do greater things for God. You know, Nehemiah can just say, oh, you know what? It doesn't affect me much. You know, sometimes we're good, we're skilled at, I like to say it's like... You, ducking pain, you know, sometimes we feel compassionate towards something and we feel, oh, I should do something, but we just kind of, oh, okay, okay. And you get busy with whatever things and then we forget about what God has laid on our heart. You know, sometimes we think that certain thing that God put on your heart, it's just the feeling. But let me tell you this, many great people that I read in the Bible they all first began receiving something that we know, many of us know as a, you know, um, holy discontent. Something that we feel that, hey, it just, break, it, just, it just breaks my heart. It just breaks God's heart. You know, so guys, let me ask you a question. What is it then that breaks your heart on, the, on God's behalf today? What is it that moves you? You know, when we have people come into this place, like how many of you guys actually take time during the week to call them up, to pray with them, to think about them? Because they're not just, you know, people who just come and pass by our church. God brought them here for a reason. I don't care, you know, what church background that you have, but I believe very much that God brought people in for a purpose so that we can lead them to Jesus. It's not about me, it's not about your own ego, but it's about the people that God loves. So don't just brush them away. I shared with you guys, right, last week about the garden, my gardener, that he came, like, 
I could just brush him off and say, oh, nothing happened. But I pray with him, and God healed him. I believe so, because the doctor says, no cancer. If I just said, oh, yeah, you do your job, you just go. I would have actually made a big mistake. That's why, guys, we need to come into the place that we actually stay in tune with God and let the compassion from the Lord, whatever actually barks you, keep barking you and just get deeper in your prayer and just align your heart with God's heart. God can take something that bothers you and you look at it and you say, somebody has got to do something. Well, it might be you. <laughs> it might be me. So don't just let it go. Amen? Compassionate. The second C is being compelled. <laughs> Whoa, I love this word. Being compelled. God uses those who kneel down to pray. What we see here, straight away the Bible said he wept and then he complained. <laughs> or not? No. He wept and then he, come on, shout it out everybody. He prayed. He wept and he prayed. And it's not just another prayer. It's not like, oh, God, thank you, Jesus, for this meal and the rest of my body. Amen. You just eat. But when you read, I wish I had time to go through the prayer right here, but we don't have the time. So, but what you actually see here, it's not just another prayer. It's not just another, oh, God, help them, help them, help them, help them. But when you actually look at the prayer of the Himalayah in chapter 1, what we see here is that he actually poured out his heart into the things that breaks God's heart. He was moved. He was compelled to the point that he prayed. And it's not just one time. He mourned and he prayed. And it's not only he prayed, he fasted. Woo! When was the last time you fasted? Some of you don't even know what fasting means. Oh, I fast Pokemon. I don't play Pokemon anymore. That's, n oh man, come on. Let us be more intentional of fasting. You know, fasting in the Bible is usually is associated with our eating. Sometimes we fast a thing that we feel like it's okay. You know, like we don't have to worry too much about that. I can just do it without that. But guys, Nehemiah, it got him to the point, he was compelled so much that I need to fast. I need to pray. I need to take time out to really kneel down before the Lord and pray. You see, God is still using those people. You know what? I wrote right here. In the book of Nehemiah, there were at least 12 times that you see that this great leader prayed. Everything that he did in order to rebuild the walls is associated with prayer. At least 12 times throughout this, this book. So I wrote here, I said, God raised up a great leader who was a praying leader. The strongest, le the strongest leaders are praying leaders. Wow. The most powerful leaders are not people who can speak well. The most powerful leaders are people who know how to seek the face of God and, and know how to pray. I can't stress this enough that we need to pray ablaze. We don't just offer God our lip service. We need to teach the next generation to pray. You guys need to teach the next generation how to pray. And it starts with you know how to pray yourself. It takes every generation to teach the next generation how to pray. Listen to this. The disciple came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. If prayer is not a big thing, why would that be recorded in the scripture? Because a lot of Christians, they don't know how to pray. Or maybe they don't care about praying. You know, when I said to you, I will pray for you. It's not just another saying. Many times, Christians use it, we pray, we pray for you. Do you? Really? Will you? Really? 
you know, if you don't want to pray, don't say it. Because you're lying. You should have a prayer journal. When you say to someone, I'm going to pray for you, write it down. And you follow up with them. I was convicted by that too. Because sometimes as a Christian, we say, I'll pray for you, pray for you. Really? You? You know, like you have to be honest. But the thing here is that the secret of being a great leader in the house of God is about knowing how to pray. That's why I blaze. We need to get excited when we come to pray. That's why I want to see that we actually carve out time once a month, everybody. It's not a lot. Tuesday night that we come and pray last week, last Tuesday of the month. That we make the time so no more excuses. I know that we have so many things, but if you never make a plan for it, you will never turn up. And I don't go because I'm a leader. Because if I don't, if I don't participate in any form of prayer meetings, what I'm doing to my spiritual life is that I just fool myself that I pray because usually I don't pray at home. Many of us here need to be in an environment that we are stirred and encouraged to pray. And I don't say this slightly because I've been challenging so many of you guys here to come to prayer meeting. And sometimes we, we have this reason. I understand all of that. And I really know that we have different agendas and stuff like that. But I'm not apologizing of challenging to come to seek the presence of God. Because I know most of us here, we don't do that at home. Don't take prayer meeting lightly. And don't take the time in the presence of God like this lightly. I'm not saying you'll be judged, but you're missing out on what God is doing. Many of us here, your spiritual life needs to be revived. And it starts by just opening up your heart for prayer. The second quality that I'm mentioning here, Nehemiah was compelled. And his, com you know, his, his attitude is not just like, oh, I got to do something, got to do something. But first thing that he did, he prayed. Because he knew exactly, he knew exactly the source of strength and the sort of solution where they come from. Last quality, quickly, being courageous. God uses those who stand up to act. After spending significant time in prayer, Nehemiah didn't just sit around and keep having prayer meetings. It came to the point that he went to the king and the thing here is that you guys see this, right? He was afraid. We just read the passage. He was afraid. You know, guys, you guys know why he was afraid? Because he looked sad. And there were times that when people in front, of the, in front of the king, in his presence, if you look sad and the king had a bad day, the king did not like you, you got killed. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm sad today, you know? Like, even before the king, you need to present your best self, but Nehemiah, for some reason, he actually, I don't know, I think God really opened the door for him because maybe that day the king had a good day and the king trusted him. But the king, take, he took notice. Hey, you look sad today. What's up? And then Nehemiah didn't just say straight away, oh, I want to go back to rebuild my walls, you know? He said, long live the king. And then if you read that carefully, it said, he also prayed before he answered. Maybe he said, what, what is it to you? Let me pray first. I don't know. But I like to think that he actually had that life of prayer, that he'd been actually living his life in prayer, that we actually communicating to God every time. So Nehemiah actually spoke his heart at the right timing. He was walking in the attitude of prayer, and he answered the king, and he told the king. And he said that my mystery has become my ministry. And listen to this, God opened the door because of one act of courage. You see, courage is not doing the things that you are afraid of. But true courage is the thing that you do when you stand up for the right thing before God. Because courage 
is not about you focusing on your fear, but courage is about you focusing on what is right. Remember Queen Esther? She was scared too. She appeared before the king. She stood up for what was right because she was moved with the heart of compassion towards God's people. I can tell you tonight, guys, that God has a vision for all of you. And I want to stir your heart, not because I want to hype you up. Because when I look at each and every one of you, there's so much that God wants to do in and through your lives. Remember what God spoke to you at camp. Remember what God spoke to you years ago. Because he still remembers. We might forget, but God will never forget. As I start out the series tonight, I want to challenge each and every one of you. I want you to be bold enough to ask God to show you his heart. I want all of us here tonight, we're going to spend a few moments in the presence of God. And I want you to forget those around you. I want you to be really brave. I want you to rekindle once again your fire for God, your passion for God. You know, last night we caught up with one of the friends, uh, the couple actually, and he's actually looking after Ablaze Singapore. He was basically pastoring Ablaze Singapore. And he shared one thing with me last night. He said this is that, you know, he talked about his son. Like, you know, more than just raising him to be a good boy, a good person. He wants his son to be someone who desires Jesus. And that because this is something that seems missing in your generation. You know, we all want to do great things for the world. But I really believe that one thing that we should start first as the basis for everything is that we have to desire Jesus. I want to take the moment to speak to those who've been doing this for so long. Many of you guys here, you've been serving in a blaze for a long time. And I really appreciate every one of you. My prayer is that you will never stop being on fire for the Lord. Don't let your career, don't let your relationship, don't let anything that will stop you from being zealous for the Lord. Because you have to trust God that by His grace, that as you actually follow Him, His will, whatever things that He called us to do, that He will provide, that He will make a way, that He will take you places. We don't live by the world standard, guys. You know, nowadays we have these new agey things that come into the church and making Christians feel like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a good principle. Yes, maybe they are. But the most important thing we need to ask whether this is what the Lord wants. Can I tell you this? People ask me, I just asked, met up with Pastor Wilson last week, a few days ago. And I told him I've been doing this for years. Can I tell you this? I never regret everything that I have done right here in this family. And when I get 60 years old, I look back, I want to be smiling because I really believe in what God called me to do. But if it's not what God called me to do, let me tell you this, I will get very tired, I will come to church you know, with a sad face and get angry with everyone. But because I know this is something that God has called me to do. I want you guys to stand up with me. In fact, I want you guys to step out from your seat. I really want us to take the moment like this, just to really get in touch with the Lord. I want us to just really take the moment just to respond. Come on, everybody, just step out from your seat. Just come, just come. And I'm going to ask you to respond. 
We're going to spend a full moment to pray for everyone who responds. If you don't, that's cool. I want you to pray for others who have responded because this is between you and God. You know, the last sermon in this series is called Finishing Strong. And that's what we want to see. It doesn't matter how well you start, but if you don't finish well, you don't finish strong, that's nothing. But the Bible said that he who has begun a good work in us, that he will surely bring that to completion in his days. So every eye closed, every hands lifted up. I want us to just really tune in right now and just allow the presence of God just to flood our heart. Healing is here. Release is here. Restoration is here. And God is here. He's a God of all ages. He will show you His heart and His dream. Don't be sidetracked by the things of the world. Don't let the love of the world take you away from God's purpose in your life. Don't let how the world defines who you are, your identity, take over your royal identity in Christ. There's so much more in Christ Jesus. There's so much more. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. We love you, Lord. We pray, oh God. Come on, let's just lift up our voices. For